All right, good afternoon, everybody, while well, the last few of us get their seats. So I was given the task to, uh, to introduce to uh, two people, and um, then I realized, how, how should I introduce them, right? There's, there's different ways to do that, very kind, very awkward. I like awkward. Um, but then I realized, you know, sometimes you have colleagues, and those colleagues become friends, right? But these guys have been around so long, they're not just friends, they're kind of family members, right? Which is a good thing, I guess. But at some point, we were in, uh, in Serbia with the, uh, with the engineering team, and when one of your family members comes to you and says, I want to kill aggregate, it is kind of disturbing, right? As a father of the family, you don't want that to, you know, to happen to your, uh, to your children. <laughs> Sorry, that goes the wrong way. Um, but fortunately, we, there, there was a, a solution around uh, called Rakia. Does anyone know what Rakia is? It is approximately 60% water. Um, and uh, well, while we were enjoying Rakia, we, uh, we thought of a way to, well, it, it could probably be done. Um, Looking to my left, I really need to get off stage quick because this is getting more dangerous. I don't want to be the next one uh, after the aggregate. So uh, please give a very, very warm welcome to Sara and Milan. Thank you, Alar, for the presentation <laughs> and for stopping there. <laughs> so um, welcome to our talk. My name is Sara Pellegrini. And I'm Milan Savic. And uh, as you know, we are in life a software engineer, but today we are here in a completely different guise, and uh, we have a well-defined target. So we are here to kill aggregate. So for those who are not familiar with aggregate, I think all of you are, but um, I want to say that the aggregate has always been one of the most weakest concept of uh, domain-driven design for me. And uh, this is the definition of an aggregate. An aggregate is a cluster of associated objects that we treat as a unit for the purpose of data changes. So um, I would like to ask you, who considered this definition uh, cluster clear and understand exactly what the aggregate is? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, who instead uh, considered this definition a little bit cloudy or maybe not completely? Okay. <laughs> and who instead now understand very clearly what an aggregate is, but took a lot of time to arrive at this uh, knowledge, at this uh, awareness? Good. I I'm curious the others <laughs> <laughs> because there are a lot missing. But anyway. In my experience, uh, uh, the aggregate remains one of the uh, concepts that are more difficult uh, when you try to learn uh, this architecture. And uh, a lot of time, uh, it's easy to make mistakes at the beginning of development. These mistakes are difficult to be uh, fixed later. And uh, sometimes these lead a percentage of uh, developers to consider the whole architecture overcomplicated. So, we are going to consult the. Oops, that went too fast. Yeah. Too fast. <laughs> we are going to consult the blue book again, and we are going to try uh, to read it, to read what it says, to bring the, to, to to bridge the gap between theory and practice. So what it advises us to do. It tells us that we should cluster the entities and value objects into aggregates and define boundaries around each. We should choose one entity to be the root of each aggregate and control all access to the objects inside the boundary through the root. And we should allow external objects to hold references to the root only. When it comes to, okay, this is guideline, right? Some guideline. Uh, when it comes to building instinct, when you want to design a system, it does not help really much, right? So usually people are confused, they don't know how to approach it, and then we see a lot of uh, problems in designing aggregates. 
And today, as you may have guessed, the theme of the presentation is Kill Bill movie. Also, Sarah is dressed. And we chose five villains that are going to represent five flaws of the aggregate. And now we are going to go through, through them all. Yeah, in order to understand the criticalities of the aggregate, uh, we can do together a very uh, simple exercise, a very simple even storming exercise about educational, uh, education domain. So uh, the system is very simple, there are few rules. The first rule is a course cannot accept more than N students. And the second rule is the N, the course capacity, can change any time to any positive integer different from the current one. Imagine these are strict constraints, so we cannot accept to arrive in inconsistent state. So, what happens uh, if I try to decrease the course capacity to a number that is lower, uh, less than the number of currently subscribed students? Uh, it is possible, and it will be necessary mm, to wait uh, a sufficient number of unsubscriptions to happen before to be able to accept a new student again. These are the rules. So let's start identifying the event. We know that the course can be created. We know that a student can subscribe to course, and we know that can unsubscribe as well. And from time to time, we can change the capacity of the course. So far, so good. So what are the triggers for these events? In this example, we can simple, simply say that these events are triggered by the respective commands. Nothing uh, difficult. So the process is natural and uh, simple uh, because of the storytelling. So one of, of the most powerful elements of domain-driven design was to break down the barrier between technicians and value objects. Eh, sorry, <laughs> not value objects, <laughs> and domain experts. And uh, <laughs> also value objects, if you want. <laughs> and uh, it, it did that uh, thanks to uh, tools that uh, are able to exploit the potential of storytelling. For example, even storming is one of them, right? And uh, storytelling is uh, extremely powerful because it, it is innate in, uh, in uh, human nature. You don't really need to have any particular skill or competence to tell a story. And uh, it really helps uh, breaking down this barrier between uh, technician and business experts. But uh, in my experience, uh, the fluidity of uh, the discovery process that is uh, really powerful at the beginning hits a snag when we try to introduce the aggregate into the story. And why is that? Because the aggregate, by definition, represents a technical concept, is a resolution of a technical aspect, is the boundary of the consistency, is uh, the guardian of invariance. So when a change to any object with the aggregate boundary is committed, all invariance as a, a, of the whole aggregate must be satisfied. So, the aggregate is the component that is uh, responsible of guarantee the strong consistency in uh, an ecosystem that by nature is eventually consistent. So at the same tri time, we want the aggregate to represent uh, uh, a concept in our mental model uh, that guarantees the business rule that we have in our domain. So it is very complex to explain this nature, this duality, to the business expert. And of course, we cannot provide to business experts any technical explanation of the aggregate. So what happened to me as technician when I try to identify aggregates? What I do is to try to find the data that are changing together, so the information that are sharing the uh, same consistency constraints, the strong constraints. And in this example, all rules were about the course. The course cannot accept more than students, and the course capacity can change to any uh, value different from the previous one. And that's why I would select the course as a good candidate to be the aggregate in this 
use case. But uh, when it comes to explain this to business experts, it's not easy. You can use some metaphors like uh, who guarantee me that these rules are not violated or in which box would you put this information, for example, or who would you address this command to. They can be technique that can uh, make it simpler to communicate with business experts, but it's not always so effective. So that is the first villain in our story. The aggregate does not fit storytelling. The introduction of the aggregate in the storytelling breaks the fluidity of the discovery process. Because it's not really naturally part of the story, right? We technicians try to forcefully introduce it to fulfill our needs. And uh, the business expert should not be worried about any technical aspect of our architecture. Nevertheless, in a way, we are asking them to identify these elements that are technical by definition. And um, furthermore, the aggregate move the focus away from the behavior back to the data structure. And now, in front of us, we have a second villain. And it says that aggregate mixes technical and business aspects. Usually, uh, when we try to model our domain, we have a mental model composed of domain uh, concepts in our head, but there are also some invariants. And usually, at least at the beginning, we do not map those very well. Uh, there are also cases where there are certain business rules that span over several domain concepts. What people uh, try to do instead of just keeping this mental model in their head, they try to just see data and see which data change together and then try to group them into some uh, meaningful group, let's call it an aggregate. But it is not so, how to say, well spread, and it's probably also not so easy because you cannot identify at once what is changing together with what. So what people usually do, we take a look at our board, this is the outcome of our event storming um, session, and what are we trying to do? We are trying to identify entities, nouns, names, uh, and in our case, that would probably be the course, right? And we are going to say, this is the course aggregate. Furthermore, course aggregate is capable of handling these commands, and it can publish these, uh, these events, okay? Now let's say that we want to store this aggregate. There are two approaches. We can store the aggregate as a uh, current state of it. Uh, here we have a course and bunch of subscriptions. But when we want to handle uh, a command, we need to load the whole aggregate. The reason for that is that aggregate guarantees the consistency inside, inside its boundaries. If you want to handle subscribe and unsubscribe command, command, commands, we are going to load everything and we are going to execute those commands. But when we want to handle update course capacity, we already have a feeling that we don't need to do anything with subscriptions, right? We are changing just the course capacity. Nevertheless, we still need to load everything, which probably leads to unnecessary loading of data and putting more pressure on network, on memory, on CPU, right? When it comes to event storage, uh, when we want to event source our aggregate, so to store the, the state of the aggregate as series of events published by it, again, the situation is pretty similar. We have events. Uh, when we want to recreate the state, we need to load all of them, which holds uh, sense for the subscribe and unsubscribe command. We need is effectively all subscriptions and unsubscriptions. However, for the update course capacity, we don't need uh, subscriptions and unsubscriptions. We can live just with course capacity changed and we want to just see whether the course was created or not. Nevertheless, we load the whole thing again, probably un unnecessary. Okay, so let's add a new business rule. The course title can change any time to any different title from the current one. And let's go back to the board. We need a new event, easy, curse rename event. And of course, a new command that triggers this event. 
So what is, in your opinion, the aggregate we should uh, uh, address this common to? Of course, it's the curse. And it's pretty reasonable. Uh, but now, the course aggregate is responsible of something more than before, right? It may be irrelevant, but it can uh, hide a pitfall. Because we have here the third villain in our story. The larger the aggregate, the greater the contention. So our natural attitude to uh, identify aggregates in the mental concept that we have uh, in our mind, in our mental model concept, uh, can lead to an unnecessary uh, increase of the boundary of the aggregate. And uh, every time we identify a new event, a new command, that can refer to a concept that we already have as an aggregate, we tend to put, uh, to mm, refer to this aggregate also for the new command and the new event. And, uh, this is okay, but we, it's paramount to remember that the boundary of consistency is also the boundary of concurrency. And uh, of course, this uh, are, is, is an important information because uh, uh, it, uh, the performance of our application depends on the correct sites in the, of the aggregate. We could, uh, for example, decide to um, identify one single huge aggregate for the single application and uh, everything can work, of course, but uh, no parallel operation is possible because uh, all the operation will have a single contention point that is the aggregate that sequentializes everything. So this is not what we want, of course. So the side sync is very important. And um, let's see an example now. Let's suppose that in our domain, we receive two concurrent command related to the same course. So one is for updating the capacity of the course, and the second one is for renaming the course, the same instance of the course. So you can uh, immediately, your, your instinct tells you that there is no um, conflict between these two operations because the capacity will not uh, conflict with the name, uh, with the title of the course. There will be no reciprocal implication. But these two commands are uh, handled by the same aggregate. That means that two replicas of the same aggregate, two instances, are loaded uh, at the same time, and they are uh, changed accordingly to their respective commands. And um, here is fine. The problem arises when we try to commit to this transaction. Because since the aggregate is the guarantee of the internal consistency, it's not possible to accept two concurrent transactions. And the first one will be accepted, but the second one will be necessarily rejected. So it doesn't matter that within the aggregate, these two commands operate on two different uh, uh, data, two different operations. Uh, it doesn't matter that changing the title will never affect changing the capacity. The only fact that these two commands are handled by the same aggregate is sufficient to prevent their parallel execution. That's it. So assigning both of these commands to the same aggregate can uh, increase the contention in a way that is not necessary in this case, for example. Because we know that uh, these two operations will, uh, will not interfere with each other. But nevertheless, this uh, uh, is uh, one effect of putting these two commands in the same aggregate. OK. Sarah complained a lot about this issue, so let's try to propose something else as a solution. Let's try to see whether we can propose something alternatively. So we can say, okay, we have contention because it is one aggregate, right? But what happens if we say that instead of one, we are going to model two aggregates? So one is going to handle the subscriptions, and the other is going to handle the um, information, so the details of the course. There are cons and pros to both. So let's see them. On the left-hand side, we have a um, course, so a single aggregate approach. On the right hand, we have two aggregates, course info and course subscriptions. With the course, we have more contention. That's what Sarah explained. But it is simpler, right? It is simpler because uh, there is only one thing to handle, one thing to create, one thing to delete. When it comes to two aggregates, we have less contention because now we can fine grain, finely grain, 
I don't know what's the, the adjective of that one. <laughs> we can uh, uh, find the, the best aggregate for our command, and not only a single thing will react to everything, right? So less contention. But there is a problem with that. Uh, there is additional complexity, and additional complexity comes from mul uh, managing multiple things. Now, when we create one aggregate, we need to create the other one as well. What if creation of one fails? If you want to close the cores, we need to close them uh, basically transactionally. But we know that ba uh, aggregates are uh, how to say, units of consistency for themselves, so you cannot impose a transaction on both of them. You need something more complicated. And now we are in production. We've been storing uh, our aggregate, uh, a single one. And then we decided to refactor our aggregate. We, s we have seen that there, are, uh, there is just too much contention on this one, and we want to change that. We want to introduce two aggregates. So there is a problem. What are we going to do? Because we already have our state stored. If we have state-persisted aggregate, uh, issue is maybe not so big because we can just run some maybe SQL script, update the, the, the fields, etc., etc. It is not said that is uh, inherently easy because we can also choose to serialize the state of our aggregate and store it as blob. Then we need to find a way to deserialize it, update what we need, uh, and then store it back again. But what happens when we were storing events instead of the current state of the aggregate? So that is going to be a little bit problematic. Let's dive into that example. Here we have uh, event store with its state. So it has events for our course, course created, renamed, etc., etc. Now we want to move from a single aggregate approach to two aggregates. We need to remap those events. So course created is going to end up in course subscriptions created and course info created. And now we are going to change the ownership of course renamed. It's going to be part of course info. And course capacity change, these uh, events are going to belong to the course subscriptions. The problem here is that event stores are how to say, accustomed to deal with immutable data. So they are not so built for um, uh, mutating events and changing, so inserting and deleting events from the stream. So it is not so easy uh, to achieve that in the event store. There are, so, sorry? Yes, we did, but we need to insert it in the stream, right? <laughs> okay, <laughs> we can do that. We can move the creation of all events at the end. But we affected our stream, right? They are belonging to an aggregate, right? We don't need to we don't need to mute the events, we just need to, to put them at the end. Yeah, that's true, but it is an operation that we need to do. We are going to do questions later. So. <laughs> <laughs> so it is a problem. So it is possible to be done. There are, there are solutions that support this. It is possible with some techniques to reorder events, to put them at the end. But it is not an easy task. So it is definitely a hard thing to do, especially in the event stream, but not impossible thing. So that's, the, that's our fourth villain. Yep. Uh, with its uh, message. So n now we arrive at the real spice. Uh, so let's uh, introduce uh, uh, one last rule to our example. Not working anymore. Nice. Can do that. Okay. That is, uh, the student cannot join more. Let me try again. No. It works? No? The student, oh, I, can, I can press the button, oh, don't worry. Uh, the student cannot join more than 10 courses. So, let's see. Back to the board, we have now student created event because we want to create the student target. And the relative command, 
But now we have something strange. We have, uh, again, students subscribed to course event and students unsubscribed from course event, both triggered by the respective command. And uh, if you have a feeling of a deja vu, you are right, because uh, these two commands and events, these two couples, uh, it was already present uh, in the board uh, when we were talking uh, about uh, the course. But now we need other two identical commands, semantically identical commands, just because there is a new rule, the student cannot join more than 10 courses, and this new rule refers to the another aggregate, the student aggregate. So unfortunately, we need, for a technical reason, to add uh, two events that are exactly semantically identical uh, to the student subscribed to course that we had before, just because the new rule belongs to a different aggregate. And that is something that is very annoying when you read your event store. So let's say that we are happy with that aggregate, the aggregate student. It can handle certain commands and produces certain events. So the aggregate student, it also needs to collect all the subscription because they are important to validate any further request for subscription and unsubscription. So when it comes to a request to subscribe a student to a course, in this moment, we have two aggregates involved in this transaction. And for this reason, we need some form of synchronization. So we need a, a component uh, that we can call Saga, or maybe not, we had <laughs> just <laughs> some discussion before, but a component that basically orchestrates this uh, long transaction, uh, dispatching the respective commands to both aggregate, the student, and the course, and uh, mm, they both handle these commands and produce their respective events. This is simple unless, for example, one of the two refuses the commands. For example, the course is fully booked. In this case, the, orchestra the orchestrator uh, needs to react accordingly, sending to the um, first aggregate, the student, a request to unsubscribe, to revert the, previously, uh, the previous subscription. So there are other solutions that are possible, but in any case, you need some form of synchronization. And here is the fifth and final villain in our story. Transaction that spans multiple aggregates could cause unnecessary complexity. So I know here that uh, the, the main concept uh, behind the aggregate idea is the, the concept of boundary, right? Uh, the boundary of uh, consistency, the boundary of uh, concurrency, but also the boundary of complexity, because the goal uh, is exactly that, right? To force the developer to define this little bubble where the context is uh, simple enough to make simple decisions, to not to have to deal with the complexity at all. So this is an important uh, value, and this is absolutely reasonable. But it's also true that uh, sometimes it's really can uh, create, that w whenever the rules uh, span multiple aggregates, span basically the border of these bubbles, it can uh, cause additional complexity and requires additional coordination. So you could tell me it's just a long transaction, what's wrong with a long transaction? Nothing is wrong and uh, absolutely uh, normal to have a long transaction, especially when they cross uh, the border of the bounded context. But the question is, is it possible to uh, avoid its complexity when uh, these uh, invariants, when these rules are uh, in the same component, in the same, in, in two aggregates belonging to the same bounded context, handled by the same software component. So we will see if it is possible or not. But for now, we just have collected all the bad guy in our story. So all the negative elements of aggregate. The aggregate does not fit the storytelling, it moves the focus from the behavior to the model, to the data structure again. It mixes technical and business aspects. It can cause unnecessary contention and complexity. And finally, 
In some cases, it is difficult to refactor. So let's see what we can do. Yes. So we've been talking about this, whether there is a better way to implement our command model. What we decided to do is to move from our uh, from model in a, in a sense, sense of data structure and to, to focus more on the behavior, which basically restarts us from the storytelling. And now we can observe a system as a series of actions and reactions to those actions. What we have uh, in the middle are decision blocks, right? So decision makers. A decision block could be a person, a lady in this case, and she can, based on her experience, but also based on some projection, some view model that she got from the system, make a decision and decides to take the action. As another decision block, we can also have a software component that, similarly to the lady, can take a look in the system and make a decision, gather the information, what it needs in order to, to execute this action, and provide a reaction. You can also consider these actions and reactions basically being commands and events. So what it gives us? It gives us focus on the decision. In our case, the decision block is the message handler, and the message handler knows what it needs in order to make a decision. It knows uh, who to ask and what exactly to ask. Another important component in, in uh, this approach is event sourcing. And why is that? It is because event sourcing decouples the storing, so the, the, the storage part, from the model part, right? So the part needed for take the decision. And this is pretty powerful. So the message handler now can use uh, events from the event stream to build on the fly model that it needs uh, to validate command and to execute the command. So let's take a look at the example. Here we have our event store. It has uh, events for the course and for the student. What we need to do is to execute the update course capacity command. Our decision block uh, used to be an aggregate. So it was the one loading all events related to the course. But we know that course renamed event is not necessary for this specific command handler. And this specific command handler just needs to see whether the course exists and whether the new capacity was different from the previous one. So in the end, we can just say, let's not use the course renamed event. Let's load only what we need, what is necessary for us, and then we can decide, okay, I'm going to issue a new event, I'm going to publish it, or maybe not. But the important thing is that we can refine this even further. When it comes to our event store, uh, the API is going to change a little bit in order to support this. Uh, we used to stream events based on the aggregate identifier. And now we are going to move to something more flexible, which is streaming events based on the query. What is this stream query? It is composed of two components. So the first one is uh, basically a set of domain identifiers. What are we interested in from our domain? And it is, in our use case, course with its specific ID. But we want to refine even more, and we want to filter based on the types of events. So in our case, that's course created and course capacity changed. Those two information together form a stream query. Again, the focus is on the message handler, uh, which means that we have less waste of resources because we are loading only what we need. Uh, we don't need now to, to group all those events into some boundaries, call them an aggregate, so we don't need to do any upfront modeling, which gives us a flexibility that we can uh, later easily change uh, which information we need to pull from the event store to form our decision. So let's see what happens when it comes to two concurrent uh, uh, requests, two concurrent commands, right? Let's see the example we have seen before. 
that is uh, uh, that uh, the system receive concurrently uh, two uh, commands, the one for uh, renaming the, the course and the one for updating the capacity of the same course. So our instinct immediately tell us there will be no conflict. These information are not conflicting with each other. There are two common handlers that have their own business rule and uh, they can load their respective event stream, building their own query and uh, rebuilding the model they need to validate their respective rules. And then they can publish their events. Easy. But what happens instead if we have another case, two concurrent commands, but this time we want to subscribe a student to a course, and at the same time we want to update the capacity of the same course. So also in this case, we have uh, two command handlers that can handle concurrently these uh, commands, but the two business rules can create a collision. So there is a risk of collision. So let's say that both these two decision blocks reload, uh, reconstruct their model, the model they need to validate their rule, uh, reading the events from the event store. So they do their respective query, they read the events, they have their model. And the first one that is able to publish uh, its command is the one uh, related to the update of the capacity of the curse. So just a few milliseconds later, the other blocks publishes the subscription events. But in this case, there is a problem because just a few milliseconds before, the curse capacity has been changed and possibly is changed to a level that prevents the subscription to happen. So we don't want to uh, accept the subscription of a student to a course. So how we can handle this situation? And here is the second uh, uh, new API that is pretty important uh, to support if you want to get rid of the aggregate. So an event source should not only support the append of uh, new events, but a new operation that uh, we can call conditional append. So it's pretty simple. It takes the events that you want to append and a new parameter, a condition. So how is it used, this new parameter? What is it needed for? It is used to verify that when I invoke the append at the append time, there are no new information that could affect my decision, that could make my uh, decision invalid, right? Uh, new, no new data I was not aware of when I, my decision block loaded events to make the, uh, the decision. So let's see how does it work. So the condition is composed of two parts. So the first is the stream query. And uh, it's basically the query that has been used to rebuild the decision model. So in other words, it is the same query previously invoked by the decision block to retrieve all information needed to make a decision. And the second one is the consistency mark. And it basically represents the offset of the last event included into the decision model, right? In other words, it represents the fact that the message handler, at the moment it took the decision to publish some events, was updated up to that specific offset. So the condition is verified when no event after the consistency marker is matching the stream query. So basically when the condition is verified, you have the guarantee that the decision block made the decision on the basis of the most up-to-date data. Indeed, when the condition is verified, there are no new events that the, de the decision block is not aware of. On the other side, when the condition is not verified, it means that there are events that could affect my decision and the decision block didn't load them. It was not aware of them. So when the condition is not verified, it means that decision is potentially wrong. So what we do is to reject the append. The event store does not accept the append. For example, I could have decided to subscribe the student when one millisecond before the capacity was decreased, and so I should not have taken that decision. So 
In this case, what it does your command handler, it can decide to retry, reloading against the model that this time will be necessarily most up to date because there is something new matching the query. And take again the decision. Maybe the decision is the same because we don't know the value of the capacity, uh, the new capacity. But the, the event store cannot accept this, um, this uh, append. So in practice, the conditional append is the guarantee that an event or a group of event is published into the event store if and only if the event store does not contain anything that can invalidate your decision. So basically represent the guarantee that you made a decision on the basis of the most up-to-date data. So in other words, we can see the conditional append as uh, the optimistic lock in an event sourcing world. So if we, let's go back to the example, we can see that we have a two command handler, they both loaded their event stream, and the last event that they both loaded was 592. So the update one, the one uh, below, uh, is the first one that is able to make a decision and try to append event. So since uh, there is uh, none other events matching the query after none 592, this event is accepted. But when the second one tried to append this event, it also invoked the conditional append. It also loaded as last event the 592. But this time, the event store recognized that there is one event matching the query that is after 592. And in this case, this append is rejected. Yes, uh, let's see what this means to our contention, right? Uh, because we now see that we are uh, basically limiting the number of events that we are loading in, uh, to, to validate our commands. Uh, that basically means that we are going to also limit the contention. Before, the, the uh, contention boundaries were the boundaries of our aggregate, and now contention boundaries are boundaries of the stream query. But we can do even more, and this comes to the modeling side. Uh, we've seen this little bit weird uh, situation, right? We had these duplicates uh, of uh, subscribe, unsubscribe for course and for the student. And it, even if you take a look at the event stream in the event store, uh, you see these unnecessary events duplicated, right? And basically they're containing the same information. If you show this to your business expert, they will say, why do you need both of them? And we know we need it uh, for our, to guard our consistency in two aggregates, right? Essentially, uh, what has happened is just one thing, right? So either student was subscribed or unsubscribed. There aren't uh, multiple things happening, right? We made them artificial just to uh, keep our aggregate consistent. But if you focus now on them, and let's say that the first step, what we are going to do is to remove the ownership. So we are going to call these events pure events. They do not belong to any aggregate or anything else. However, uh, we need a way to relate them somehow to domain concepts. So we are going to introduce another layer on top of our pure events, which are basically tags. And these tags are going to point to certain events. If we now focus on our student subscribes and duplicate, we can easily say, OK, instead of two events, let's store a single event, but let's have two tags, two pointers, two domain pointers pointing to the student subscribed event. With this, we are also going to even reduce our event stream. So this grants us another exceptional advantage. We can see it through an example. So let's see what happened in our system when we receive a request to subscribe a student to a course. So we have a, a common handler that knows exactly all the business rules that must be validated in order to accept this request. If both uh, the, these rules are validated, so if we have uh, no more uh, courses for student uh, than allowed and no more student per course than allowed, we can decide to publish the events of the subscription. So 
In this case, we can take advantage of the flexibility of uh, the query to load at the same time the events related to the course and to the students, and to uh, recreate the model about the student subscribed to the course and the course um, that the student joined, and to validate both invariants at the very same time. So the business rules are validated at the same time, and in one single transaction, we can commit an event that is now related to both uh, the domain identifier, the course one and the student one. So that means that the event source should not only be able to uh, append new events, but new domain events, where the, new domain, the domain events is just the pair formed by the events itself, and the domain identifiers. So the domain identifiers in our example are uh, a key value pair, where the key is the concept in the domain, the curse, the student, and the value is the identifier, uh, the unique identifier. So it could happen that in the same transaction, I want to append events that uh, are referring different domain identifiers. Let's take this example. If, uh, with this subscription, I reach the full capacity of course. I want to append a course fully booked event that in this case will relate only to course, not to the student. And they can be in the same transaction. Let's focus now on these pure events that we extracted before. There are some characteristics about them, right? So, so they uh, do not belong to an aggregate, so they basically uh, represent a mapping closer to what happened in the real world. Uh, it is just a fact that something relevant to our business has happened. Uh, it can be related now to m one or multiple domain concepts, or to zero, uh, essentially, and it gives us less complexity. Less complexity, again, comes from there is from not being owned by, by anyone. Uh, now, the business decision can easily involve several uh, domain concepts into one decision. Uh, decision is taken into a single place, that's our decision block, that's our message handler. And coordination, the famous saga, uh, coordinator that needs to coordinate between several uh, units of, of consistency is no longer needed inside the single bounded context. We still need to coordinate across bounded contexts because we cannot impose consistency there. It also gives us more flexibility, which comes from the event sourcing, decoupling the, the persistence from the, the model, uh, makes our refactoring easier. Uh, now we just need to add or remove event types from our stream query or just to add and remove uh, domain identifiers from our uh, stream query. So the aggregate is finally dead together with the, all the negative aspects. So this new approach that we decided to call dynamic consistency boundary has several benefits. It integrates naturally into storytelling. It focuses on the behavior and not on the model, on the data structure. It reduces the contention and the complexity, and it simplifies the refactoring. So I'm sure you're thinking, OK, this is amazing, but so bad that there is no product supporting dynamic consistency boundary on the market. And here is the good news. In Axonic, we have a full team committed to kill the aggregate. <laughs> so <laughs> we are cooking a dynamic consistency boundary. And here is the team. So besides me and Milan, we have Michael. Where are Michael? Are Mi upstairs. Yeah, Mark, uh, uh, Marco, and Stefan that are around here, I hope. Great. So we can take some questions now. Do we have uh, time? Yeah, we can. Especially about reordering of the event store. That one was really interesting. Um, there's a few questions, uh, but there's also a break lurking in the in this is the distance. Let's just take one. I think there's, uh, I lost my app. There was actually one question rephrased differently. Oh, there's more questions now. Here we go. 
Um, but there's a question around uh, command routing. How does command routing now work if you don't have an aggregate uh, to, uh, to point it to? How, yeah. how does that work? Do you want to answer? No. Okay. So uh, we still have uh, tags, call it domain identifier, and you can define a routing strategy uh, based on the domain identifier. In general, uh, the, so we are not uh, mm, thinking that dynamic consistency boundary is the tool that you should use in all occasions, because aggregates are a good fit for uh, several situations, right? So it could be that in the future, uh, having this uh, additional tool uh, that completely support is backward compatible with aggregate, you can have one tag that is the aggregate identifier that represents the aggregate identifier. So this tag can be used for routing. So uh, with the same consistent hash mechanism that right now we use with the aggregate identifier. Yeah, so basically the concept is the same. Is now we instead of one identifier, we have several, but yeah. the concept is the same. Seriously. And there's one question that uh, we don't have to answer, but I do really, really want to pose this question out, out loud. Um, which core concept is next? <laughs> I just hope it's not me. But. <laughs> Saga, of course. Be careful. <laughs> Let's keep that one for the break. If you want to hear the answer, join them. So thank you, thank you very much for this, uh, this awesome talk.